Um, so I'm, um, I'm a Wayne Shell. I'm currently at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. I want to first thank the organizers for giving me this distinct pleasure of giving the opening talk for this very exciting conference. So for this, um, I want to do something special here. I want to tell the story of math and me. My goal is to hold your attention for the next 20 minutes and hopefully to entertain you. Now, this is very challenging since I've not received any formal training in acting or storytelling, but I will uh, still try. And I will now share my screen. Okay, let me turn on my timer. Okay, so the title of this talk is How Could Math Possibly Hurt You? The story started in the early 90s. Out of extraordinary luck, I was awarded a full scholarship to study at a small liberal arts college called Pomona College in Southern California. Pomona College had fantastic professors across the board. So I had difficulty choosing my major I had particular difficulty choosing between math and biology. I loved math because it's beautiful. And I loved biology because it is mysterious. I wanted to combine the two, but the two seemed so disconnected. And biology textbooks had, had very little math with exception of say Mendelian genetics and Michaelis mental enzyme kinetics. Math books offered very few biology examples with the exception of the Lotka Volterra oscillatory dynamics of prey and predators. I was leaning a little bit toward biology, so I discussed my dilemma with my academic advisor, who happened to be a mathematician. He thought about it and said, why don't you just double major? But whatever you do, do not stop math. How could math possibly hurt you? So I double majored, I proved the theorems, and learned molecular biology. Happy years went by very fast. Finally, it was a time to apply for grad school. At that time, there was no systems biology or quantitative biology. While retrospectively, there were biology subfields with math in them, but I was either not exposed to them or was not sufficiently interested in them because they did not involve experiments. I remember that I attended a math conference to present a poster. I wrote on my poster, looking for a math plus bio PhD advisor. People walked by and looked at me amused, but I got no responses. So I was forced to choose between math and bio. I chose biology. Molecular biology was just boiling with excitement at that time. You could do genetic screens to discover new genes and even whole genetic pathways. You could also do biochemistry to purify protein complexes based on their activities. Importantly, you get to name these genes, these protein complexes, and these pathways. Now that sounded like a lot of fun. I also wanted to be a very good experimentalist, so I went to Caltech to study biology. I happened to read Lee Hartwell's, Cal I happened to read uh, Lee Hartwell's papers and got interested in the cell cycle. That is how one cell divides into two. The cell cycle is a red hot field because uncontrolled cell cycle leads to cancer. There were lots of folks studying DNA replication in the S phase and the mitosis. So my advisor and I decided to pick a cold spot in this hot field to study the exit from mitosis. We chose the budding yeast as our model organism because in, in yeast, you can do both genetics and biochemistry. I worked very hard and learned a lot. In the end, I not only got to name a new gene, but also I got to name a new protein complex and discover a new regulatory mechanism and tie together multiple genes in the mitotic exit pathway. So I published a huge paper. I was very proud of myself. But two weeks later, a similar paper appeared in a different high profile journal. That meant that I had only advanced science by two weeks. So this anticlimax got me doing some very serious soul searching. 
I wondered whether math could give me a unique voice. But by then, my math had gotten embarrassingly rusty. <coughs> Excuse me. Plus, why would math be useful at all? My own graduate thesis is the best testimony that one can do very good biology without any math. But then I thought, perhaps math could offer me a second microscope. As an analogy, you can do very good biology without a microscope, but you can do even better biology with a microscope. This transition was terrifying. I have always liked to have a solid plan of attack, but this time I had no plan except for joining a physics biology lab for my postdoc. When I arrived at the Rockefeller University, my postdoc advisor told me, well, you could do any project that you wish, but please make it entertaining. Month went by in the library, and I still had no faintest clue on how to combine biology with math. I read Luria and Delbrook's paper on fluctuation analysis and wished that I could do something that brilliant. I read about nonlinear dynamics and chaos. I read Waddington's work on canalization and the evolutionary robustness. To make a very long story short, I burned my first year as a postdoc looking for a project that bridged math with bio. Fortunately, I secured a Damon Runyon postdoctoral fellowship, but I was getting increasingly nervous. At around that time, people in the lab start, started discussing game theory. I read upon game theory and became fascinated. In game theory, cooperators pay a cost to help each other, resulting in a net benefit. Cheaters do not pay a cost, but exploit the benefit generated by cooperators. But then why won't cheaters always win? There are in fact many examples of cooperation in biology. For example, plants provide food to pollinators and pollinators help plants to reproduce. Pollinators can cheat by eating the plant food without doing any pollination. Well, I didn't really feel like chasing after the pollinators in the wild. So I thought to engineer yeast strains to cooperate by, by exchanging metabolites. I was very lucky. Turns out that back in the 70s, yeast geneticists isolated the mutations that overproduced the metabolites, and they also released these metabolites. So these scientists were at the verge of retiring, so I promptly wrote to them and secured some of these strains. I then created my own yeast cooperative community of two strains. One needs X and overproduce and release Y, and the other does exactly the opposite cannot make Y and overproduce and release X. And I call this COSMO for cooperation that is synthetic and mutually obligatory. I can also engineer cheaters that take but do not give. So now with, uh, and a cheater has a fitness advantage over cooperators. So with COSMO, I finally had a solid plan of shooting two birds with one stone. I could use COSMO to understand how a cooperative community might evolve from the very beginning, that is, why I mix the two strains together. I could also use COSMO to test the mathematical modeling. The COSMO dynamics can be described by four differential equations, two about the, two, the dynamics of the two strains and the two about the dynamics of the two metabolites. And if you look at the equations, it's clear that each strain would need five parameters. For example, let's focus on this one. We will need to know the Y release rate per cell, the amount of X consumed per cell, and then how fast this grows at various concentration of X. And so this is growth parameters, and there are three of them. It's a maximum growth rate, the affinity for X, that is the concentration of X at which half maximal growth rate is achieved, and then death rate. And the same, there will be similar five for the other strain. But then um, after doing some very simple back of envelope calculations, I realized that um, to understand Cosmo growth rate, I only needed the release and consumption parameters. So there are two plus two equals four parameters instead of the total of 10 parameters. So this was the first paycheck from a mathematical model. It can tell you what experiments to skip. So I quantified the two release and the two consumption parameters, 
and plug them into the formula. But to my great dismay, predicted growth rate was far off from experiments. This might actually seem like a small difference, but remember, growth is exponential. Even small difference in growth rate would amplify exponentially over time in terms of dynamics. This was hugely discouraging. This community has been simplified to the very bare minimum. Yet, I could not predict its growth rate. What could possibly be happening? I thought about it. In fact, many things could be happening. The release and the consumption parameters could change in different growth conditions. Cells could be evolving. So the lesson I learned was that quantitative modeling is much harder than I had thought, and certainly much harder than what the literature seems to suggest. Fortunately, Cosmo Evolution provided some pleasant surprises. So I would evolve this community by repeatedly grow it and dilute it. Found that Cosmo evolved to grow better instead of crashing under the evolution of cheaters. So in this experiment, we could inoculate 96 well, uh, wells with uh, initial, various initial total cell densities while fixing the strain ratio at one to one. And we noticed that the threshold, when the total cell density exceeded this threshold, communities could grow to saturation as indicated by this white biomass. But below this threshold, nothing grew. And for evolved communities, the threshold was pushed to lower levels. That is, Cosmo could survive at a lower total cell density than the ancestor. And this helped me getting a faculty position at the Hutch. But then I had to revise my plan of attack. It would be hard to convince a new graduate student or a new postdoc to figure out why the quantitative modeling of Cosmo did not work. The project seemed very complicated and does not even sound that exciting compared to figuring out why Cosmo evolved to grow better or how cooperators could survive cheaters. But what about qualitative modeling? That turned out much better for us. For example, we simulated the spatial organization of the two cooperators and the engineered cheater. So the two cooperators are in the red and green and the cheater is in blue. In simulations, those two cooperators formed clusters and excluded cheaters. And experiments showed qualitatively similar results, although we can obviously see that quantitative details differed. So this is paycheck number two from math modeling. Simulations provide additional support for experiments. In the minute we have a model that we can trust, we can really use it to our advantage. For example, we could ask crazy questions such as what would happen if diffusion constant was infinite? It's a paycheck number three. A validated model can sometimes give us intuition about impossible experiments. So we happily sailed along this path of qualitative modeling, but something kept bugging our experiments. We were trying to compare evolved cells with ancestral cells. We wanted to see whether cells could evolve to be more generous. That is, whether they could release more metabolites per consumption. The generous mutants can promote cooperation. So we, we are very interested in seeing whether they could possibly evolve. But when we measured the release rate per consumption, we got highly variable results. This week, mutant X would do better than the ancestor. But the next week, we would observe the opposite. We controlled for X, we controlled for Y. Always the error bars among replicates within experiments. Within experiment were very tight, but error bars across experiments were depressingly large. And this made any meaningful comparison impossible. This frustration with variable results lingered on and on for over a year. Eventually, it dawned on me that perhaps the way we measured the release and consumption was no good. If the release and consumption phenotypes from these assays were not good enough to predict community growth rate, why would they be good enough for phenotype comparisons? So then we took the long path of building chemostats and making sure that they worked properly. Chemostats allow cells to be cultured in a fixed 
nutrient limited environment that mimics the community environment. For example, in excess nutrients, yeast would normally double at 1.5 hour doubling. But with Kimball stats, we could force them to double every three hours, five hours, and so on and so forth. We can then try a range of environments that mimic the nutrient limited community environment. We then measured release and consumption phenotypes in these different growth environments and realized that phenotypes were highly sensitive to the growth environment. Incorporating these chemostat measurements, quantitative modeling finally worked. Experiments and modeling agreed. And because phenotype measurements are now much more consistent across experiments, we uh, indeed find a generous mutation that, in fact, gener generous mutations that would increase the release rate per consumption. And this in turn promoted the community growth rate. So this is yet another very important payback from modeling. When model prediction deviates from experiments, this tells you that you're missing something very important. In this case, our phenotype assay was wrong. In recent years, we have also started writing pure theory papers. We wrote theory papers to critique or develop upon other theory papers. For example, in this preprint, we critically analyzed the current causal inference methods. We also wrote theory papers to figure out how to best conduct challenging experiments. Let's consider artificial selection of microbial communities. Microbial communities can display functions that member species cannot because of species interactions. So how might we select whole communities to improve community functions? We can grow up many communities, allow cells to grow and mutations to occur. And then we can then assay community functions and select the ones with the highest function to reproduce where we split each into multiple offspring communities. The conventional wisdom would suggest that you get what you select for, but this is not true for community selection. Quite a few published experiments showed not so impressive results. But this experiment has many knobs that you can turn. For example, how many communities you would select from, how many cells you would use to start these communities, how long do you wait before you assay a community function? And how many do you select to reproduce? And so on. So instead, we simulated community selection experiments and learned that even routine experimental procedures can derail selection effort. In this case, computer simulations allowed us to compare many selection strategies and to figure out what works and what does not work. Thus, math modeling teaches us how to think about complex problems. As a summary, I hope I have convinced you that math has, could help us in many different ways. In our case, it told us which experiments to skip. So instead of 10 parameters, we only need to measure four. Provided additional support for experiments and gave us intuition about impossible experiments such as infinite diffusion constant. And it, it, alert, it alerted us about important missing pieces. Uh, this is like the wrong assay and it helped us to judge and build on other people's theoretical work. It taught us how to think about complex problems. So now look back at what my math professor said. How could math possibly hurt you? Well, there are unfortunately biologists who believe that a theory paper is not really a paper. And these people do sometimes get to make very important decisions on funding and on faculty hires and promotions. Fortunately, the tide is changing. Many people are now doing math and bio. And many biologists believe that math is important for biology. So I'm very fortunate again that these biologists, the latter biologists, served on the review panels of prestigious awards such as the WM Keck Foundation Award, the NIH Innovator Award, and the UK Academy of Medical Sciences Award. In fact, we are moving our lab to University College of London next year so that we can be in a university with math and physics departments. 
I hope to continue my intellectual growth, including learning more math and applying math to new biological problems. If you find my story interesting, I've posted other behind the scenes stories of our research journeys, and it's posted in medium.com. And if you'd like to join our new adventure in London, or if you're just interested in math plus bio in general, I'm very happy to chat. And thank you very much for your attention. And I'm ready for questions. Thanks a lot, Wen Ying. That was really a really nice story that you told. And congratulations on the, the position at, uh, at UCL. We'll be thank looking you. forward to having you closer in Europe. So maybe since I don't see any questions on the q and I'd like to actually ask something myself. So something I, I really like about, well, the story that you told, and I've known your work for a while, is how, how much effort you put into making quantitative predictions from your models. And I guess my question is to what extent do you think it's necessary to make these quantitative precise predictions as opposed to having more theoretical models? So you mentioned that you're starting to also work on more abstract models that don't make quantitative predictions. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so there are many different styles of model. So there's always a trade-off between, um, uh, between different types of models. For example, if you can make the model very abstract and that would capture general principles that are not specific to a particular system. You can also make very specific model for tailored for a very particular system like the, the Cosmo model. And then you could get quantitative insights. And I think both types of models are very useful. So the general model, of course, it helps you to get uh, general principles and we all love general principles. But then I feel like quantitative models, uh, indeed for this case, for in our case, it really paid off because I actually tried to ignore what it was telling me. And we were stuck for actually, I don't know, at least a year, right, on this irreproducible experimental results. And, and then once we realized the assay was not right because we could not even predict the very simple quantitative trait of the community, then everything fell into, into, uh, into place. And we, you know, it not only, it rescued two projects, this quantitative prediction rescued two projects, right, one for the, um, for the comparison between the, the model experiments and set, sort of like give a case study of how you would do quantitative modeling if you wanted to. And the second told us that our assays were wrong. So we revised the assays and now we, we found the mutations we want. So I would feel like the both types um, are useful and that's why it's so much fun. You can try different styles and see <laughs> which will work the best for you. Yeah, that's why I, I, really, I really enjoy this. Nice, nice. Thanks for that. A really nice answer. So we have two questions that, uh, that came on the Q&A that, that are actually quite similar. So they're both asking with somebody with a limited background in math, how do they get started with, uh, with like building the, a good foundation? That's a very, very good question. That's actually a question that I think deserves a one hour discussion. Right? So, um, so I think there are multiple answers. So the way I did it, and I mentioned my math was embarrassingly rusty, so I actually endured a lot of humiliation <laughs> in postdoc, right? Because picking a math up was harder than I thought. But I think one very useful thing was that uh, was what happened at Rockefeller was somebody gave me a piece of math lab code, right? So it was about some famous paper on ultra sensitivity. So then I could change parameters and I would see, wow, the simulations give me very different results <laughs> depending on the, the parameters I put in. So that got me really interested. So that got me hooked. And I actually immediately start to see it could be useful because it allows you to very quickly test the hypothesis. So, so this one lesson is to get to established code from people who are willing to help, right? You can even ask somebody to write a piece of code for you and then you can build upon that code. That's much easier than you know, learning something just from ground zero. And then the, the other ones are actually probably more fundamental. And I like to do experiments on you know, human subjects in, when, I, when I say interview research tech uh, candidates. So I would always ask them about uh, a question about doubling and that concerns logarithm. And actually to my great surprise, more than 90% of college graduates had forgotten about the logarithm. So then I don't quite know how to deal with that. That's such a fundamental, I don't know, such a fundamental concept that you know, ideally should be in your blood. Right, so even if somebody woke you up at two in the morning, you should be able to answer the logarithm question. And so that 
I, I do not. I think the whole system, the whole the, the entire education system, had to be changed from like the very early on. And I would say that uh, taking and so I am aware that there are many more courses on math bio uh, combinations. For example, UW offers such a course, and uh, we would actually hold students' hands and go over these very basic concepts. And actually, students could grasp them quickly. So it's just after some review, after giving them examples that's convincingly useful for your research, you would actually remember them, right? So these are my thoughts. 